we are live now okay so maybe you can start now to hand over to session james can you take over okay well uh, welcome all to the second session uh, of uh, today so today the speaker is mr prabhu teja let me briefly introduce him. Uh, Mr. Prabhu Teja uh, is doing his PhD in EPSL Switzerland, and also along with that, he is also working as a research assistant at India Research Institute. He works on making deep learning uh, training uh, work uh, when the resources are constrained, mostly in the domain of computer vision. He has also has experience of large scale optimization. So, and his talk is mostly on uh, introduction to deep learning. Now I'll request Mr. Teja to start the session. Uh, hello. So I'll start by sharing my yeah. screen and okay. Uh, can you see this? Yes. Ma'am. Yeah, yeah. It's good. okay. Perfect. So hi. So as I've been introduced, I'm Prabhu Teja and I'm a PhD student at EPF in Switzerland, and I I. Mostly work on what are called domain adaptation techniques, which is essentially uh, a lot of these deep learning methods uh, need data from the exact exact uh, situation where you want them to work. And domain adaptation sort of breaks this assumption and says we can train on slightly different scenarios and make it work in in the scenario of interest. So I I spent some time at Amazon in Bangalore before this, uh, before my PhD, where I was working on NLP applications, and mostly uh, applied to Amazon's advertisements. And I, I also spent some time at uh, uh, Siemens Health and Years, uh, where I was looking at uh, healthcare, uh, basically healthcare applications of machine learning, so mostly medical imaging uh, types. So here is what I want to present today. And this is a broad idea of what message I want to convey. So I want to tell you, show you that deep learning works. I also want to show you that it doesn't work. And in a very specific form, when I mean it doesn't work, as in it breaks in very specific ways. And it has now forced us to examine problems that we had not uh, looked at in a very long time. For example, I'll, I'll get to these examples. For example, most classical ML people, so people who, essentially, I would say classical ML people are people who did an intro to machine learning course before 2012. That's that's a very colloquial boundary that I would draw. So what exactly is deep learning? So um, to all of us, this image is a dog and there is really no ambiguity about it. And to a computer, is it's just an array of numbers, as uh, Abhijit mentioned in the previous uh, talk. And machine learning, deep learning specifically uh, try to look at this array of numbers. When I mean an array, think of if you if you uh, use Python, think of it as a list of lists, for example. Um, machine learning and deep learning takes this large list of numbers or an array of numbers and tries to make sense of what is inside it. And what deep learning does is it tries to do that automatically. And I'll tell you what automatically that means. Before this, I'll digress and define what is called a neuron. And a neuron is basically what the basic unit in the, in the human brain or basically brain of most mammals is. But mathematically, we'll define a neuron as something that takes in a vector as an input. X is a vector in, in uh, in d-dimensional space. And w is another vector that is, a, that is a property of a neuron that is also in d-dimensional space. And what this uh, angular brace is, it is just an inner product. So uh, inner product wx is just w1, x1 plus w2, x2 plus w3, and so on, plus a bias. So, so if you look at it carefully, it really represents, for example, if you take, take the case when d equal to 2, so W1, X1 plus W2, X2 plus B. That's what this function represents. This is just a line. It is AX plus BY plus C equal to zero form. It's, it's, it, it, it is literally drawing a line. So what we can do is take this line 
and compose multiple of them by basically saying, let's say, let's say the ones in greens are axes, and each blue is the neurons function output that I mentioned. So all these axes generate one output. All these axes generate another output, another another output, and another output, and another. Output. So, so we can compose a, a, a much deeper layer network by stacking all of these. And for for example, the the so the arrows present here are what we would call weights. That is that is the w w vector that we show. But since there are multiple w, such w's, we can stack all of them together and call it the w matrix. And after each blue, that is the output of uh, one operation of these uh, of these linear functions, we we generally place what is called a nonlinearity. A nonlinearity is just a function that is not linear. So uh, a standard one would be something like using a pan hedge or a ReLU function. And we repeat this process as many times as our problem needs. But in this example, I will stop with just one layer of processing. And after that, we do uh, one once more, some other W times the hidden layer outputs uh, will give us uh, the output that we, the final output that we give. Let's break it down a little more because understanding this is sort of important to everything that follows. Let us call the input xi as I mentioned before. Uh, so this is, let us say it is a vector in di dimensions. In this case, di is four. And all the intermediate connections, that is the gray arrow marks are called weights. So what should be the size of this weight matrix if the hidden dimension, that is the number of nodes in blue is dh? Is that it just becomes uh, uh, it's a matrix of the size di by dh. That's uh, what this shows. So simple question, just to make sure we understand this. What is the size of this hidden to output? So what is the size of uh, this, these, these weights? It just becomes dh times do. In this case, do is just one and dh is five. So we, we have a matrix that is five, five by one. So what is the overall function that is represented? I said we use non-linearities, right? Let's call them sigma for now. What, what did we do? We took an X, multiplied it with a matrix, applied a non-linearity, applied with, multiplied it with another matrix, applied a non-linearity and got the output. And if you have figured out this pattern, it you can nest these arbitrarily. So you can add four more weights and increase the processing. In all this, I have talked about these weights, and I have not talked about how these uh, we, we arrive at these weights specifically. For this, we define what is called a loss. A uh, standard, even in if you did uh, support vector machines, you have a hinge loss. So similarly, in deep learning, we have some loss. Loss is essentially a function that quantifies how correct or wrong a network's predictions are. So this network takes an X as input and predicts F of X as output. A loss merely quantifies what should be the ideal output for that X and how wrong we are. And to simplify that, let's assume that the loss is a nice parabola and, and we only have one weight. Instead of multiple weight matrices, let's simplify that and say we only have one weight. Training in deep networks is done with something called gradient-based learning. And I'll tell you why it is gradient learning. So let's assume uh, we, cur we currently we guess that uh, weights, weight W1 solves the problem. That is, it gives it gives the required output for all the data that we have. It is obviously not the case because it's just a random guess. What gradient based learning says is start with here, compute the derivative. So draw the tangent to this curve and head in the opposite direction. So this is called gradient and the opposite direction is the descent. So that is why this method is called gradient descent. So what I'll do is now update the weights to W1 from W1 to W2. I'll do it once more. I'll compute the gradients at W2, move on to the next state, W3. 
and move on to the next state of your profile. Move on to the next state of your file. And I do it for some number of steps. And after some time, I realized that I actually come to the minima of this uh, minimum of this function. What does this minimum of, uh, of this loss function correspond to? As I said, loss is a quantification of error. So I have found this W star for which the network has the least amount of errors. And this seems like a good place to use this, use this network. So with these W stars, we hope that the network works when we use it for some time. For some time. I mentioned what are called multi-layer perceptrons, so that is each input is multiplied by a matrix and so on. Depending on the kinds of data that we are actually dealing with, that, that might not be the only functional form that we are interested in. For tabular data, for when I mean tabular data, it's just a table of uh, numbers or features or something like that. We would use something called an MLP. That was something I described before. For images, we would use convolution networks. And this was something Abhijit briefly touched upon if, you're, if you were present in the previous uh, session. Uh, why, con why is this convolution? So, if you need some intuition for why this works, think of uh, what each data represents. An image represents a 2D grid such that uh, near neighboring pixels are somehow related. For example, if you take two, two, two consecutive pixels in an image, they most likely are very, very similar. A convolutional network exploits that redundancy in that image. For sequences, and, and when I mean a sequence, it can be a sequence of text or an audio signal or any time series data. For example, if you have some data from uh, some sales data as a function of time, we used to use something called LSTMs, that is long short term memory. And these are specifically designed to handle the fact that the input is a sequence, as in there is an ordering between two inputs and the ordering makes sense. For example, in a, in a piece of text, Two words are not occurring at random. They make they have to make semantic sense. So that sequence uh, nature is used by LSTMs. There has been something called transformers. Uh, this is this is about four years old now, and in several ways they have uh, revolutionized all these all the previous uh, assumptions I have told you. And transformers break most of these assumptions, and that's why that's what makes them very interesting. Um, so in the earliest era of deep learning, so I mentioned all these things, then we sort of knew that these things would work pretty much in the 70s, 80s, and 90s as well. And one of the earliest, most important applications that showed that deep learning would work was this number recognition engine that uh, Jan Leka and his group built in 1980s. So what it does is it takes an image of a number, in this case, it's shown as a character, but numbers between uh, zero and nine, process it with a convolutional uh, neural network. A convolutional neural network, what it does is it applies a weight to each part of the input and produces an output. So you see this box here. So basically that part of the input is multiplied with Ws and added, and it produces a single output here and this process is repeated. So this was very important because the whole, this system was deployed to read a lot of checks. So automatic check reading, if you see a check, there is a sequence of numbers at the bottom and this system was uh, used to uh, read those checks automatically and it was of great success. But it, uh, it sort of died, the wave died soon after because of several reasons, one of which is, it is very hard to prove theoretically that something works in deep, deep learning. And that still remains an open problem uh, and I'll get to it later. But, so if, if this network existed in the late 80s or early 90s, what is the big deal now? Uh, what is driving its success? One of it is, we just have substantially better computers. We just have great CPUs, great GPUs, and Google has something called TPUs, called tensor processing units, which are specialized hardware made for uh, transformer type devices. 
and suddenly we also have free, free or cheap hard disks suddenly we, we can store a lot of data that was just not possible in the 80s or 90s and because of this uh, cheap storage we can now afford to have what we would call internet scale data for example a lot of nlp people would used wikipedia the entire english wikipedia as training data for their models this this was this became possible with the availability of uh, cheap storage devices another very important thing is scientific resource sharing which is now there are a lot of toolkits uh, called uh, something like pytorch which is backed by facebook tensorflow and jax both uh, made by google these are abstractions. These are toolkits that help users build deep networks with very with very little deep involvement. For example, I I, I discussed what we uh, what I call gradient descent. If you use one of these toolkits, the toolkit automatically does all that optimization. So it makes a lot of things easy. It makes building applications very easy. And we cannot obviously ignore the decades of machine learning research that happened before that built that the current deep learning wave builds on a, a lot of previous ML research. So a very important breakthrough as I see it uh, happened in 2012. And so there is this competition called ImageNet. ImageNet is, is a large scale visual. It, what it is, is it ha uh, they've defined thousand classes of images. When I mean classes, thousand object categories. So dogs of breed a, a cats, cars, bikes, and so on and so forth. And there are a thousand of them. And this competition was considered the pinnacle in computer vision uh, tasks. So that is, if, if one were to solve this convincingly, we can claim that we have made progress in computer vision. And if you see, uh, in the first year of the competition, that is 2010, every so it was a competition so people submitted their models and it was evaluated and so on in the first year of the competition the best uh performing system had more than 25 percent error this was pre-deep learning so so was the case in 2011 but 2012 was the first large-scale deep learning system built was by something called uh, by somebody called alex Krizers, you know, from the university of toronto and their, their model was the first to bring down the error below the 25% uh, uh, boundary. And suddenly the error dropped very, very fast. By 2018, I think it, it came down to 3.5% or something like that. So, so something that was very high a decade ago is now considered pretty much a solid data set. What does this AlexNet do? Again, it's a convolutional net, but because in 2012 GPUs were not very, uh, very strong or basically not uh, did not have high processing power, he had to do multiple. He had to split his model across GPUs and train train this entirely this very large model. So the input is a 224 by 224 image, and he would process it. Uh, by convolutions uh, and what is called pooling and so on and so forth, and predicts a thousand dimensional vector at the end. Why is it thousand dimensional? It is because I said, as I said, uh, ImageNet has a thousand classes. So to any given input, we have to pick one of the thousand lab predefined labels. So, so given this thousand dimensional vector, one can just take uh, find the max where the maximum occurs, and that is the label of the input image. That is how AlexNet works. And this was the next uh, big breakthrough. Uh, again, I'm not getting into the specific architectural details because each of them warrants its own one hour of presentation. So this is called what is called a transform. And why is this very fundamentally different from the previous one? In the previous one, we, as, we, we exploited the fact that this was an image. We exploited the fact that in an image, if you take a small region, that region is probably very coherent. For example, if you take a three pixels uh, window in an image, all three pixels, quite like all nine pixels, sorry, quite likely belong to a single object or a category. Transformers breaks all such assumptions. 
it basically says everything can be represented as a list and everything can be processed as it. So it started with NLP. And now even vision uses a lot of transformers. So does speech. What um, Transformers has done is it has brought about this change in what are called pre-trained models. What are pre-trained models? Let's say a company like Google builds a transformer-based model. And it trains it on very, very large scale uh, data sets on very large uh, compute infrastructure. Instead, so, uh, and they release this pre-trained model to the public. So anybody can download it and do whatever. What this has done is for a new problem that I am interested in, I don't have to color, collect very large amounts of data and, uh, and train my own network from scratch. Instead, I would download one of these pre-trained networks and just what, what I would call fine tune. Fine tune is really changing the weights just a little so that the network works in my in my use case. And transformers have made that, made that possible at a very large scale. So let's look at some fairly impressive outputs of uh, modern deep learning. So these, these images, these extremely realistic looking faces have all been generated by by a network, by something called a generative adversarial network. What is a GAN? A GAN is a network that generates, generative network. I'll tell you why, what is adversarial. So it's a generative network. So it, it takes in basically a random noise as input and converts that random noise to a very nice looking output. In this case, they decided to model human faces. And why is it adversarial? The way these networks are trained to, to output these faces is in an adversarial fashion. So it is like a network predicts a face. There is another network that says, no, this is this is artificially generated. This is not a real face. So the, the, the first network that generated the face has to get better in trying to confuse the second network. So you see that this is sort of a fight between two networks. That is the adversary part of it. That these are very impressive results in terms of uh, image generation. Take this very new example of what most of you have heard of. This is called DALI 2. DALI is, is, a, is a machine learning model that takes a text as input and generates images. So, and people have made very ridiculous captions and the network figures it out. See, a Shiba Inu wearing a beret and a black turtle line. I'm pretty sure there is no image on the internet that probably that has a Shiba Inu wearing a hat and a sweater. But a network realizes that Shiba Inu is a dog, so it puts in a dog. It has to wear a beret, and uh, so it puts in a nice uh, cap where it is needed. And a turtle neck, it it knows it has sort of understood that when a dog wears something, where should those uh, objects be? So where should this sweater be, or where should this cap? Be? Similarly, a close-up of a hand palm with leaves growing from it. You see that it is the network is able to put in fairly realistic details of uh, what a hand should be, what leaves should be, and what growing from a palm even means. And this is a much more famous example, I would say. Uh, I'm sure most of you have heard of this company called Tesla, and they have an autonomous driving system. So it really, the car is fitted with a series of cameras and and these cameras determine how where the car should go automatically. So you see this, all this processing is done automatically on the fly, basically with the hardware present in the car. It detects where the zebra crossings are, it detects where the lane markings are, it should go left, what is it, is, is there a stop sign, what is the speed limit, and so on and so forth. I'm sorry. Just give me one second.
So uh, let me share the screen again. So, okay, cool. So all these applications have been made possible as in there is this uh, autonomous driving by Tesla that works in some cases. Of course, if you followed the news, you see that Tesla has been known to crash in cities and it's, it's known to fail sometimes. So look at this example. So this is a large language model. A language model is one that sort of generates text. That's how it's trained. It's trained to basically say, given these 10 words, what would be the 11th word? So it sort of tries to understand what a piece of text means by learning the context. And this was a model that was trained on absurdly large amounts of data and on lots of, on lots of computation. And people have found that it has figured out how to explain jokes. And I'll read one out for you and see how convincing it is. The input is, I was supposed to start writing the paper at 5 p.m., but then I started playing with this cool language model for 10 minutes. And 10 minutes later, it is suddenly 9.30 p.m. And the model explains this as follows. This joke is about how time flies when you're having fun. The person was supposed to start writing the paper at 5 p.m., but they started playing with the language model instead. They thought they were only playing with it for 10 minutes, but it was actually four and a half hours. So you see that the, the, these deep models have saw in some ways understood what the input is. Of course, they fail in several other cases, but the fact that even these examples exist is impressive enough. So these are just examples to show that deep learning works, except when it does not. And I'll show you some examples of that also. So this was some work I did last year. Um, so this was, think of this as, the, uh, as, an, uh, as an application to autonomous driving. So given a scene from a camera, which is the first column, all these images, I'm supposed to predict all the, uh, predict, uh, sorry, segment all the objects in the scene. When I mean segment, I have to label each pixel as belonging to an object. In, for example, this, this shrub or this edge, they're all in the grass category, let us say. So all of them have, each pixel in that has to be labeled as green. Green is just uh, color coding for color. And all the all the pixels corresponding to the road and uh, also have to be labeled. Basically, all the pixels in it. And here is the task I was looking at. I train a network to do so uh, on data collected in in Europe. That's because that's one data set that is common here. And I try to deploying I, I try to deploy it in Asia. I predominantly, let's say, I think Japan and Taiwan or something. And these networks break, even, even when I train the network in Europe and try to deploy it in Asia. When, for example, see this. See the case of, yeah, ah, let's say the last example, so the last row. You see this nice two lane road, and here is a footpath. The ground truth says it is a footpath, but my model predicts this as a road. And you see that this can have catastrophic effects because uh, this essentially means that the car can decide to go on this part. And of course, if a car drives on a footpath, we, it can uh, have very disastrous consequences. So data, this is called data shift. Why is it called data shift? Because the way the data looks in Europe is quite likely different from the way data is in Asia. And this, this, can, arise, this can arise from various reasons. Some of them might be physical. For example, uh, Europe, the camera sensor might be different. Well, the data collected in Europe might be collected on one camera, uh, and the car uh, and the data in Asia might be collected on different cameras. The world is different. The kinds of buildings that exist are different. The kinds of cars that exist are different. All these represent what are called data shift or uh, domain shift. And this has very serious degradation effects on these deep learning models. Take this very simple example again. Um, models are brittle. This one paper showed that take an image, place a uh, so 
um, okay take an image uh, and this image has a scooter in it i just and the model predicts it correctly as a motor scooter with a 0.99 probability so it's very confident turn the scooter around it predicts it as a parachute put it in the air it calls it a bobsled lift it do a wheelie with it it calls it a parachute similarly take a fire truck place it normally on the road it's called a fire truck with a 99 percent probability if it is flying for some reason it is called a school bus if it is inverted it's called a fire boat and if if they put an actual crashed fire truck it's called a box you see that while while the network has done phenomenally well in recognizing it in the first instant that something is a motor scooter or a fire truck it fails pretty phenomenally after that as well see that somebody raised their hand and was there a question so one more case where these deep networks fail and fail for them these are called adversarial samples and in some ways this is very similar to the generative adversarial network that i mentioned uh let's say this is a soap dispenser right so so we can take a network that predicts this correctly as a soap dispenser add some structured noise to the input and make it predict as something else in this specific example the uh, the first column represents the images that are correctly classified by a by a trained network or a model to that they add some very little noise and you see that uh, perceptually the third the column images are exactly the same as the first column the network calls all the images in the third column as ostrich and the 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 surprising part is this noise can be can be computed at an image level so i can make i can take any image take uh, see that if it is correctly uh, correctly being predicted as a correct class add this noise and make it predict whatever i want this might seem like this is just a toy example that i made up to show this point but people have shown that these adversarial samples occur in the real world as well so this this is a very important case where a deep network fails and fails very catastrophically just makes no sense that it does this when it works very well in most other cases here as i mentioned um, there are these large language models right these large language models are trained with data from the internet when i mean data from the internet it is literally a web web crawler somebody wrote and it dumps data and they train with it when the data set is that large curation is very hard and when curation is hard a, a language model can learn to can learn very spurious uh, biases biases uh, we'll see this and the text the, the text in bold the best for a man's career is to is given as input like like i said uh, like i showed the previous example of a joke the bold is shown as uh, is given as input and the subsequent part is is generated by the model itself so the best for a man's career is to is the input and the model generates to be the best in his own skill the second one is the best for a woman's career is to and it says it to be a housewife and take this very common uh, case in the uh, of uh, people denying climate change regarding global warming it is well known that and the model generates the earth's climate has been changing for thousands of years which is a very common trope that a lot of people who deny climate change say that it's happening all the time so you see that when when the data becomes large output becomes more coherent but it also picks up bad things from the data in a way that we don't know it it has somehow picked it we don't know what has influenced it and how to avoid this specific thing so given these specific specific failure cases i want to show you some specific theoretical and practical problems that deep learning has brought to the fore so uh, let us focus on image a that is the image on the left for a while so this is 
this is the bias variance curve if you did an introduction to machine learning course which basically says this if you increase the size of the model the training loss keeps going down and down but after a point the test loss keeps going up after a point so what is the optimal model size is the one where this trade off is hit that is this point is optimal trade off and this is a very standard bias variance decomposition that uh, most people has have seen what people have shown is why the training loss keeps going down and down but keep increasing the capacity of the model when i mean capacity of the model number of parameters in the network so if you have if you have a two layer networks make it a five layer network a, a 10 layer network and so on and so forth what people have seen is this this behavior shows till a point that is as the training loss goes down test loss goes up so the network only remembers the training set and it doesn't actually work it has by heart uh, the previously seen examples but after a threshold the test loss go starts going down again and this is very weird because this sort of breaks our intuitions as what is what we would call overfitting and underfitting. And this threshold is what is called the interpolation threshold. This is this is an extremely important theoretical problem as to why that's why does this happen? For example, the AlexNet or any of the large networks that I had talked about, they're so large that they're bigger than the size of the data set. The data set are in, in, in ImageNet is about, I think, 11 million images or something like that. They have hundreds of millions of parameters. For some reason, they seem to work, and we don't really know why. Similarly, large compute is the norm. When I mean is the norm, see this, see these early 2010 papers. See, see the six layer MLP on MS at the corner. It has something like 10 power 14 flops. Flops is basically a uh, floating point operation. So this basically number of additions, multiplications you do in total per, uh, to train the network. AlexNet is somewhere here. It's about 10 power 18. And starting 2016, we saw these extremely large scale training, uh, mostly done by large companies. You have heard of this AlphaGo. Uh, which is basically a, a reinforcement learning system that beat uh, the world's best Go player. And you see a large number of models that are that cost a lot. When I mean cost a lot, that take a lot of computational effort and data. Effort. And this has sort of become the norm in terms of beating the state of the art. One can say, of course, GPUs have gotten faster, and they have. Uh, there is no doubt about it. But this opens up a lot of important engineering issues in deep learning. Let's see those. Let's say if you have too much data, very large data and very large models, we use some standard methods, something called data parallelism. What this is, is accommodate large. So when we have too much data and if we process it sample by sample, we'll just take absurdly long amounts of time to finish processing. So we collect them together and process. But when we collect them together, the amount of memory needed goes up so to to handle that we use something called data parameters similarly if the model is too big it is so big that it won't even fit on one computer one gp one one graphics card what we would do is we will split these models to so that they sit on multiple bond, multiple gps and this is called model parallels how to efficiently implement these are still open problems there are some uh, headways that people have made into data parallelism but model parallelism is something that people still uh, work on. Uh, as I explained, that large language model from Google that explained jokes was trained on something like 6,000 TPUs. So think of a model that is trained on 6,000 computers. How will you efficiently uh, handle uh, the data loading, for example, or even how to communicate between these 6,000 computers so that j uh, just communication should not take more time than, tra than training the model? So th th these are some very interesting um, engineering problems that deep learning gives us. And as I said, uh, training a deep network is essentially an optimization problem. When I mean an optimization problem, it is really minimizing the loss function. 
when the loss function was as as nice as a parabola as i showed before we know how we, how nicely it is we can find the minima by basically going in the negative direction of the gradient and everything works out in reality a deep networks loss function is very very non convex what i what do you mean by non convex it has a lots of ups and downs and most of these minimums don't make any sense or the network if you stop training the network there it wouldn't work at all there uh, so somebody plotted this nice uh, visualization of how a deep uh, deep networks loss landscape looks like there is this nice blue minima where if if we pick the weights from here or the optimization features there it works very well but you see that in this messy landscape how does a network automatically land up there why why wouldn't it, why wouldn't it just stop there we don't know uh, optimization for the deep networks is is an open problem that there are lots of things to be worried about and one is a uh, more general issue of so of how we stay in a society take this example of deep fakes i'm sure all of you have heard of this so this is some you can see this video on youtube so this is uh, kate mckinnon from saturday night live and somebody uh, used a, an, i think an existing deep learning model to make her look like hillary clinton you see how convincing this mapping is and this did not need some uh, phenomenal engineering effort it was just something done with off the shelf tools this is this is this might look like a funny uh, example to look at but think of all the negative effects one can imagine from tools like these being available to you so there is a substantial amount of uh research not research or a discussion on what we would call ai ethics just because we can do something should we do so is a very simple question right so should we do should we be, we can do this but should we be doing this so in some ways i wanted to this was basically the set uh, the points that i wanted to make to you in terms of a high level overview of what deep learning is it is just deep learning works but when it fails it fails spectacularly and spectacularly and for reasons we don't fully understand and this is very important when we want to deploy these models in safety critical applications for example you don't want a car to fail spectacularly you wouldn't buy a car if i if if i told you if you put the put it in fourth gear and press the brake and accelerate at the same time the car blows up you would never buy a car right but deep learning some it fails spectacular formats and we don't know there are several new problems that it has brought to the fore both theoretical and practical and i want to end with this this is pretty cool stuff and if you get a chance you should work on this so i'll stop the presentation here and take some questions and in maybe in 5 minutes or so i'll move on to show you how to build a simple deep learning model so i'll stop here so yeah uh can you tell me how deep learning helps in object detection it's so so deep learning in some sense is a, is a representation extraction so previously you would have used something like sift or so so deep learning replaces that part and makes a bigger system that that describes the image for you and what you do with the description is up to you object detection is one object recognition is one segmentation is another application that i showed you so deep learning essentially is a feature extractor in most of these problems and if you are looking for some pre trained models there is a package called torch vision uh, torch vision puts out some nice examples not examples but nice pre trained models pre trained on some publicly available data sets that you can download and start using in some uh, applications that you have in mind can you explain uh the curve yes one second let me go back to that curve and i'll share my screen so uh so uh 
I hope you are referring to the one on the left. Maybe I'll repeat myself. This overfitting, underfitting curve is essentially saying that if you use a model that is too large for a problem, that model will essentially by heart the training data and won't generalize. It's really like saying this. Uh, in an exam, I by hearted the textbook, but the moment I saw a new problem, I did not know what to do. That is basically what, what this means. So that is the training risk. The, I have by hearted the textbook very, very well. But when the exam comes, the test I get very poor uh, marks in the exam because I, I have just by hearted the textbook. And this is how people understood overfitting, underfitting uh, in the context of classical deep learning. What, uh, what has come out in the recent past is that after increasing the model capacity beyond a threshold, the test risk, that is, that is basically the test loss basically, starts reducing again and it goes down much faster. So for example, once the model becomes larger than a threshold, test loss is substantially lower than it was previously. Now, in the specific case of how to avoid overfitting, uh, in traditional machine learning, for example, if you were doing some linear regression or uh, SVMs or random forests or some of these, there exists some very standard techniques. Regularization is a very standard technique. Deep learning seems to be surprisingly immune to this. That is, it does not overfit as horribly as we think it is going to in spite of it being very large and too many parameters and not as much data, it seems to work. So people do use uh, regularization methods in deep learning, say things like uh, dropout. There are methods like dropout, there are things like batch norm, and of course the uh, weight regularization like L1, L2, all these exist. But we have found that if we have just about enough data, we can train absurdly large networks without worrying about most of these things or most of worrying too much about most of these things. I hope that that answers your question. Uh, Alex says, what is the size ratio and how do we decide this? Yeah, um, you don't decide this ratio. You I would basically go about in the opposite direction. So I have a data set. D collecting data is generally harder, right? So what, here is, I have some data set that I can work with. What I would do is I'll try increasing the model size progressively and see where it starts overfitting. That's basically how I would do it that way. And I don't know if there is a crisp formula to determine what is the network size versus what is the data set size to do so. So I don't know the exact formula, but I would go about essentially by checking when it starts to break. Can you please put some pointers how these things are related to the for the future of deep learning? Okay, so that's important and maybe I didn't focus enough on this. Uh, yeah, so when I mean the future of deep learning, it's... Uh, so what is so when I give this absurd caption, a dog wearing a, a a cap and a turtleneck, basically, I don't imagine many places in the world where this might uh, make sense. Right? However, it makes sense semantically. It may I can still put a cap on a dog. I can still put a put some clothes on a dog. This deep network has figured out that semantics. So it is not remembering something from the data set. It has figured out that a dog looks like this. So a Shiba Inu looks exactly like this. And a Shiba Inu wearing a hat does not mean a hat is on the floor next to the Shiba Inu. It, it has to sit on top of its head. And it has to wear a dress means it has to be on its body, not again somewhere floating in the sky. So you see that a, a deep network understands composition. And you and this now has. Think of the case of uh, digital artists. If I want to draw something or paint something, suddenly I'm not starting from scratch. I can start with an automated generated image and make it look better. I, uh, as a digital artist, my life is slightly simpler. Some people say that it kills digital art also, but that's a different discussion. So, uh, at a more conceptual level these large networks under, seem to understand the world. 
there are cases where it fails. There are lots of people say that they don't really understand and so on. But for most examples that we can think of, they seem to understand. When I mean understand, understand the physics of the world. That is why, uh, as a future of the deep learning, that, that is why. So we are now able to model uh, the world more accurately. That's why I think this is an important breakthrough. Yeah, exactly. Uh, is this what we call black box? Black box models uh, comes from the fact that we don't know what is happening inside. Here is what we know about the system. I have given this sentence. Uh, I have given this sentence. It has generated this output. What it did with it is something we really don't have understanding of. So that is why when it breaks, we don't really know how to exactly pinpoint why it stopped working or why it generated a nonsensical output. That's the black box aspect of it. There are people, there are new research directions uh, looking into uh, interpretability of these models, which is really saying, here is a big model. It takes an input, seems to be doing correct things on average, but why does it do those things? It's, it, that is something interesting. So that is something people have been looking at. And if you are interested in uh, opening up these black box models, you could look at interpretability literature. I've trained my small, small model by fine tuning YOLO V3. It detects my object well, but if I take the little object too far, it, it does not detect. Although the object is what may be the reason. YOLO, so this might just be a scale problem. And honestly, first things first, I am not an expert on computer vision per se. So I can't, I, I cannot tell you exactly why YOLO V3 might not be working in this case. But as uh, what you see, in, uh, basically, um, in computer vision scale is a fairly fundamental problem. For example, is a small dog a dog? Is a large dog a dog? For example, if you take a very close up of a dog to the network, it's something that people do consider quite a bit. So there are lots of methods that look into this. And what you seem to be describing is something that, that uh, like that it's like if you take the object too far away it is not able to get uh, get that object right so when you fine tune maybe you could look at artificially generating data that looks like it is far away by cropping and so on or sorry or nearby and far away by cropping so augment your data and fine tune the model it might be slightly better there So I'll paste a link to a collab notebook. So I, I gave you an extremely high level overview of what is possible with deep learning. And you maybe we'll solve a simple problem. Now, um, here is a collab notebook. Uh, if you open it, you should see something like this. I hope everybody is able to access. And because this is a small example, you really don't have to do much coding. I'll, but I'll tell you all the steps of uh, building essentially a deep network. So the code is almost done, but as a first step, do these four steps. When you open this, you will see this copy to drive. Click on that. If you have not logged into your Gmail account, it will tell you to log in. And once that is done, you basically have a copy of this collab notebook. I'll wait one more minute to make sure everybody has, uh, has these steps.
does anybody have issues with this part so so maybe i'll start and go through steps of the process and most of for most parts i only expect that you have you know what machine learning is specifically and i'll run you through the steps so to run a code you just have to click the uh, click the play button on the left side so run this this is matplotlib inline is, is just a command to make sure that the plotting when i plot something uh it plots in in this web page directly it takes a few seconds for the first command to run because it has to connect the it's called front back. So here is what we will do. First things, it is not reflective of, for example, uh, building an object recognition system. It is those systems are much more involved and require a lot more uh, thinking about the problem. But this is a much simpler example that we can do in half an hour and understand in and out. Here is what we are going to do. We are going to use MNIST, that is the data set that I, had, that I had mentioned from the 90s, build a small network that recognizes digits in an input image. And what should the network architecture be? As I said, images, we generally use convolution, convolutional neural networks. So we uh, will use yes. one part. Yes. Yeah, there's a sorry to interrupt you. So yeah. can you please a little bit zoom your screen? Ah, OK. If possible. I have no idea how to do that in Zoom. Oh, okay, okay. Okay, otherwise it's fine, no problem. Let me see. Uh, I really have no idea how to do that. So okay, okay, no problem. All have access to the code lab, so we can continue. Okay. Somebody uh, type con control plus, control plus. Yeah, okay. I don't know. Is, is this better? Uh, yeah. Yeah, it looks fine. Okay. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Sure. So, so the problem, the data set and the problem I mentioned are the data set is what, what is called MNIST, which is a data set of images of numbers, handwritten numbers, zero to nine. A network to train. And this, we need specific details of what architecture we will use. So in the previous, I previously mentioned there are two matrices, WIH and WHO and whatnot. Right? What should the sizes of those matrices be? It is something that we 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 design as practitioners. In For this example, I will give you a specific architecture. So that architecture is a small CNN. It is it is very similar to the old 90s Alex sorry Lenet CNN that I had shown in the first part. What is the loss? A loss, as I said, is really something that tells you how wrong or right a network is. And I will use a loss called a cross entropy loss because it is a classification problem that I'm dealing with. And I'll use an optimizer called add. So I talked about gradient descent, right? So there are multiple variants of it that have improved so many existing problems and one such optimizer is called Adam. And I will we'll use that. And this is important to learn that I'm really handholding you sort of through the important parts of what we would call the deep learning science. Basically, what is a good network to use? How do we know that something is even a reasonable chance, a choice? And I'll use something called PyTorch, which is a toolkit by Facebook. Um, I'll run you through what some of its primitives are, but obviously it's way too large to go into details. And for most parts, you only need to know Python programming and hopefully some amount of NumPy style programming should be enough. And uh, if you have done an intro to machine learning course, this should be enough. So, okay. so. First piece of code that I'm looking at here is are this bunch of imports. So import torch, import torch, torch.n, and I'll tell you what these are. Functional is just a set of functions that torch implements. Torch vision is a, is a package uh, written by the folks in uh, Facebook itself that is specifically for vision application. So it provides some data sets, some standard data sets, some standard operations of the shell. It's just, it just makes life easy. 
and matplotlib for plotting. Uh, and you can ignore, if you don't know what PQDM is, ignore it. It is just something I have for convenience. It is literally a progress bar. That's all that it does. And this is the important part. A, a device is, is literally a physically a device. It can be a CPU or a GPU. All that I'm saying is, I'm saying, use the device as CUDA, that is a GPU, if it is available, otherwise just stick to CPU. That's all this, that's, this line says. So let's run this. It has imported all the pod modules I need and it has defined a device. Here is a network definition. And he, so uh, each module, as we call in, in PyTorch, imports from what is called NN, uh, as I said, torch.nn as NN, imports from this PyTorch's module. And this module is the one that lets you abstract out a lot of details. For example, e each module can have a convolution operation, can have an activation, uh, like a ReLU operation, like a max pool operation, like a dropout operation, like a linear operation, and so on. What this does is, it handles, okay, uh, simply speaking, I previously said we need to optimize the parameters to figure out the parameters that work for a problem, right? This module tells PyTorch internals automatically what those parameters are. So convolution will have some weights, uh, a linear will have some weights, and this nn dot module tells the uh, uh, PyTorch autograd machinery that these are the weights that you need to pick up and so on. And a lot of them, this is done automatically. So here is a specific network I took. NN congruity, the first layer is a convolution that takes one channel as input. Uh, why is it one channel? I'll come to that. For one channel is because it is not an RGB image, it is a grayscale image. It is literally a grayscale image of a handwritten character. So one channel input. and I, I say I should generate 32 channels as well. So there are 32 convolution kernels inside. Each kernel should be of the size three by three. Again, a design choice that I made, and I'm not getting into how this three, why this three makes sense. And one is just the string. So apply this operation, this convolution operation to each pixel. That's what this is. Follow this by a ReLU. If you don't have a ReLU here, like let's say I delete all ReLUs, what happens is it just becomes con, 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 max pool, whatever, linear. If if you put two, two linear operations, when I mean a linear operation, a convolution is also a linear operation. If you put two, two linear operations together, you can represent uh, the combination of these two as a single linear. So all that we would be doing is basically using more parameters to do a to do a simple linear operation. On the other hand, the moment we place the nonlinearity here, we are actually using all, we are essentially increasing the expressive power of the network. And these are phrases I'm using very loosely, but I, I suggest anybody interested to uh, go look these up as to what a non, why a nonlinearity is needed in a deep network. So here is one. So uh, the next layer, gets 32 channels that I generated before. And I say, I want to now output 64 channels. So the input is uh, w, pix w by h pixels by one. And here it becomes w by, h w by h by 32. And the next step, it becomes w by h by 64. And these 32 and 64 are parameters that I choose, assuming that these choices make sense. And then there is something called max pool. Max pool is literally take max pool two is re is really downsampling an image, but instead of down when I mean downsampling, I don't throw out every second row. I take the maximum by in a two by two window. That's what this does. Instead of blindly take instead of blindly indexing the array, I just compute the maximum in a small two by two pixel neighborhood and take and retain only the maximum. Discard the, the other three pixels. This reduces the spatial content size. So if the input is of size uh, 32 by 32, sorry, let's say 28 by 28, after a max pool, the output size would be 14 by 14. 
but hopefully we have only retained the important ones uh dropout is a regularization technique it is something that we now don't use much of but i'll leave it at that um flatten is 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 really flattening so it takes in a w by h array and generates a wh vector it just flattens all the pixels and if you compute by hand i get about 9216 such uh, pixels so i take 9216 and do a linear operation the linear operation is literally a matrix multiplication and reduce the dimensionality to 128 do a ReLU, do a dropout and from this 128 i go down to 10 why is it 10 because there are 10 digits to be recognized this is the network so when i predict i i take the output so it will be for a given input it will predict 10 numbers because the last output is of dimension still i just take the maximum response so over these 10 uh, 10 uh, numbers i compute the index of where the maximum occurs and that is the digit that i'm predicting that is the digit that the network is predicting that is basically how this works a forward function is basically what to do when a sample is given so let's say x, let's say x is the sample all that i'm saying is yeah just pass it through the network in a sequence that's all that i'm doing i hope that is clear and i'll move on so i said i will use torch vision right that just makes things easy in a vision problem and this is how it is Torch vision dis defines some, some standard data sets and has some methods to download them automatically. So this datasets.mnist is the data set that I'm interested in. I want to download it into a folder called data. And I want to download it if it is not available. And this transform is basically those images. Think of this as just loading a PNG image or a JPEG image. You load and you get a set of numbers. No, you don't automatically, you don't necessarily feed it right away to the network. You do some pre-processing. And the pre-processing I have chosen here is, I I divide all the input pixels by 255. That is dot 210. Why 255? Because by default, uh, pixels are encoded as unsigned integer, which, is, which takes a maximum of 245. 2 power 8 minus 1. So, so I just divide by 255. So all inputs now are of the range 0 to 1. And then I normalize. What is normalization? I subtract the mean and divide by the standard deviation for all the pixels. Why is this done? People have found that it stabilizes the training process. This is a, again a very engineering part of deep learning. Shouldn't the network figure this out on its own? It probably should, but Experimentally, we see that using this helps slightly. So here is a function that does get get data set and get us get a set, get the train set or the validation set. So let's look at uh, if you run this, it downloads and it just shows what the data set looks like. So I'm just picking some twelve random number input digits. So when the class is eight, the, the one sample of it. This is one sample of five, another sample of five, two, one. So this is basically how the data set looks. It's literally black background, white digits, and this is what we are trying to look at. Is it clear till this part? Because from now on, the training starts. So I'll I have installed CUDA for NVIDIA graphics, but the kernel is getting started, uh, getting crashed. Um, first things, uh, if you're running on Colab, it shouldn't matter because it doesn't run on your laptop. And I'm really not sure why uh, Kuda kernel would crash after start. So I don't know if I can uh, help with that. But to run this example, you you need a very bare minimum laptop because it doesn't run on your computer. It runs on Colabs, wherever it is hosted. Can you please explain transform normalize? Okay, okay. Um, so one of the ways, so this 0 0.1307 
is the average pixel. So once you divide by 255, you have a training set full of images and you can compute the mean of the pixel values. And when I computed it, it comes to 0 0.130. This is the mean of mean over the entire training set. 0 0.30 is the standard deviation over the entire data set of the pixel values. And transforms normalize. Okay, so let us see if we can do that quickly. Transforms normalize uh, applies and applies an operation like this: x minus mu. Uh, Uh, by sigma by ah yes cool so the operation that i am doing here is this x minus mu by sigma x is the input mu is the computed mean sigma is the computed standard deviation that is what normalized implements why does this help? It's more of an empirical idea that if you have a control over the input data range, optimize uh, the network just learns faster or better. That's it. Again, this again, as I said, this is the sort of some sorts of engineering that we do uh, to make these networks work. So, okay, so we're running out of time. So I'll move on to the two important steps in what is training a network. What does training mean? It basically means loop over the training set. Take all the samples from the training set, pass all these samples through the network, compute the output, and it, if, if it makes errors, compute the error, that is the loss I described. And to reduce this loss, update the weights and biases, right? And do this a few times. That is basically what the training loop is. And what does testing mean? Again, take the test data as batches, or basically take, take test samples, maybe even one by one, pass it through the network output, pass it through the network, get the output, take the index of the maximum element, and call that the prediction. Simple enough, right? So this is the this is the train and test, and we will look at the code. So I define a function called train, which takes in a model and the training data. Obviously, I am also taking the test data because I want to benchmark the performance as the training happens. So as it, I want to know if the network is actually learning something or am I am I do I have to change something. And number of epochs is basically the number of repetitions I do over the training set to say tra to train the model. And again, this is what we would call a hyperparameter. Uh, this might be very problem dependent. An optimizer, as I said, is added. What does the optimizer work on? It works on the parameters of the model, the weights and the biases of the model. So I'm saying torch.optim.adam is the optimizer that I'm using. And it needs access to the model's parameters. Model dot parameters. The reason I said we use a nn dot module is that when we do that, model dot parameters collects all the weights and the biases automatically and tells the optimizer, oh, these are the parameters that you need to change to make the network more accurate. That is what the convenience of using that nn dot module in the network definition is. Otherwise, you have to do all this by hand. Like you would literally store a list of all the parameters, give them one by one to the optimizer, and let the optimizer do its job. And the criterion is nn dot cross entropy loss. It's a it's a standard uh, loss that is used for classification problems. Now, for number of epochs for e in the range of t range is just uh, i'll show you it's just a tracker uh, progress bar utility for e in range of number of epochs what i do is i loop over the training data when i loop over it i get the images 
and the correct labels. Optimizer zero grad literally says, make the gradient zero. It is literally re resetting the state of the optimizer or the gradient before each step. What we do here is this image, uh, the image badge is first sent to the operatory device. Device is a CPU or a GPU, depending on what you have. In this case, we have a GPU. So this data that is loaded now is transferred to the GPU and model of data just calls it, just forward props the data through the, through the network. And it produces what are called logits, which is the 10, 10 dimensional output I had mentioned. Given that 10 dimensional outputs, how wrong are we is defined is, is something that the criterion tells. That is the loss. That is the cross entropy loss. So cross entropy loss takes the outputs of the network. What it is actually supposed to be, that is again coming from the data set and computes the loss. Then we do loss doubt backward. See, all these are things, all these are primitives implemented by PyTorch itself. So when you do just loss dot backward, it automatically computes the gradients with of uh, gradients of the loss with respect to all the parameters in the network. If you didn't have PyTorch, and for example, if you were to implement this from scratch in NumPy, you would write the backward function. And it's a pretty painful function to write. PyTorch or JAX, all these things make these very easy to use. So loss dot backward computes all the gradients and stores it internally, internally as in, in the network itself. Now, given these uh, computed gradients, what do I want to do? I do the optimizer step, that is update the weights so that hopefully the loss goes down. That is the network make less, less number of steps, less number of errors. That is what this loop implements. Now, this is just to, as I said, that is just to track the progress, right? So after one, so for E in range of number of epochs, and then, so if you see, this indentation matches this, which means after one pass over the data set, I want to see how well my model works. So all that I do is I test the model once. So I take the model, give it test data, and see what the what the accuracy is. So what would that be? In the test function, again takes the model, takes some data set to run it, and epoch number only to print it at the bottom. So this is so I do a model that eval. This is to tell the model that oh, so I use something called dropout. Right? So dropout behaves differently at train time and at test time. I'm telling the model here that it should work as if it is in the uh, uh, in in the test mode. And torch dot no grad really disables the computation of gradients. It is only to save memory and nothing else. Uh, okay, so that is a small bug. Okay. Let me do this okay so okay uh, make this one line change in your code it shouldn't mad massively change anything but uh, yeah uh, will this is correct you need to use a model dot train so as i said n and the dropout module works differently in training and testing so while training i'm telling the network oh do whatever you need to do in the training mode that is what model dot training does. In testing, I'm telling do whatever you need to do in in the, in the test mode, and I'm also saying disable the gradients because it saves memory. So again, same loop, loop over the test data, predict predict the model's outputs, and take the arg max. Arg max is literally the argument of the maximum element. So tell me the index where the maximum element is. If there are 10 numbers and the fifth element is the maximum, arg max will tell me five is the output. And I want all of them to be brought back onto the CPU because, because it's just process. It is merely accuracy computation. And the number of corrects is basically, I have predicted something. 
and I have the ground truth labels of the test data. In how many cases does it match? This is the number of corrects. I hope this is clear enough. So the accuracy is number of corrects by total number of test samples available into 100. This is just to track the experiment. So let us put all of these together. First, let's get the data set. I get the data set and I use what is called a data loader, which is data loader does this job of data set is a collection of samples. A data loader puts them together in the form of batches. And it does a few other things like shuffling. For example, over each epoch, we don't want the network to see the data in the same order. So we shuffle, just shuffle the data uh, order. So all this is something that data loader does uh, internally. Similarly, test data and test data loader. So it is the exact same code, except that I don't want to shuffle the test data because there is, it's just for me to understand if the network is working. So now I instantiate the model, uh, digit recognizer that I, defined, that I defined in the top and move it to the device that I'm interested in, that is the GP. I want to test, so before training, I want to test once how good the model is. Can anybody take a guess what, what that performance should be? Without training, if I just test the model, what is the expected performance? You can type it in the chat. It's a simple probability problem. There are 10 classes that you can predict, right? And the network does not know what any of these 10 classes even means. So it will pick one at random. So in principle, the accuracy should be about 10% before trading because, because the network just picks one, one of the 10 at random. So it is one in 10. So accuracy would be about 10% with some variations here and there. So I want to test this model and then train it for five epochs. Five epochs is basically five runs over the training set. So let us, okay. So let us run the test function and let's run this. Oops, digit recognizer is not defined. Why is that? So I did not run this. Okay. So it takes a few seconds. It takes almost a minute. And okay. So the accuracy of our network is about 18.5%. It's not 10%, but it's pretty close to being a random choice. And hopefully we move away from random choice very fast. So you see that even after training after one epoch, that is just one view of the data set, our network is about 98% accurate. And just to give you an idea, I think for the first few years of MNIST, I think people were getting about 94, 95% accuracy. And, and ConNets pushed it to that 98% accuracy for the first time. So, so roughly speaking, we took about maybe seven, eight years of ML research progress and coded it, coded it up in about 15 minutes. That is basically, how powerful or how much uh, nice the uh, nice the uh, tool sets have got. So after five epochs of training, we get almost ninety nine percent accuracy on this digit recognition task. So before I get to the questions, I'll introduce the mini project that I had proposed. So the idea is that so you here you saw the example of. Uh, a simple digit recognition. Can you extend this to full character recognition? I have posted some links for some open source data set. I could not find an Odia character set online, but I found some Malayalam character set somebody had posted. So instead of MNIST, MNIST is this data, is this number digit, numbers data set. 
use that Malayalam. If you do find a Odia data set, that would be awesome. It would uh, also fit with the theme of the program. You, this is more of a learning process. So, um, Malayalam is also a pretty complex language. It has something like I think hundred character classes. So, it's a much bigger problem to solve. It. Here, it is just ten classes. So, you, I posted a link to that data set in the in the project description. So the, your goal would be to build a recognizer that does essentially this, but for a larger data set. There are lots of things that you need to think about. One is what should the network be? Here I use this network, this, where is this? This small network, and it works quite well. Does this work for that Odia set? Uh, sorry, for that Malayalam set of characters? I don't know. You should try it out. What is the pre-processing to be done? In this case, uh, all the digits are nice 28 by 28 images. I don't think that is the case for that data set I had mentioned. So you need to do some pre-processing essentially in the transforms. In this, you can add multiple other commands. Go to the PyTorch documentation. You will find lots of help there. What is the pre-processing done? What needs to be done to make it work? And of course, architect, what loss function to use? Loss function is probably the same. What optimizer to use? How long to train it for? And so on and so forth are things that uh, you should think about in implementing this mini project. And it is a simple enough mini project, but it, it basically uh, helps you through all steps of the uh, machine learning design process including data set processing, network design, hyperparameter choices, how to evaluate, and finally see if it actually works. Yeah, sorry sorry to interrupt. The sure. Actually, the mini project link already I have pasted in chat. So if ah, you okay. want, you can maybe explain directly from there. Oh, OK, cool. Uh, OK, cool. So I guess you can. So here is what, this is the link to the Malayalam one. So you can use this. So your task is to come up with an architecture that recognizes the character in the given input. Again, very similar to the example that we saw. Think about data pre-processing. What do you need to do before a CNN operates? What should be the exact operation, exact architecture? So I, I used, I, I want 32 outputs, I want 64 outputs. I did, how did this 32, 64 come about? What is the importance? Run a few experiments and figure it out. What are the hyperparameters? What optimizer to use? I used Adam in this example. Why Adam? Why can't it be something else? It can be something else. But experimentally, try it out. And I personally use PyTorch a lot. It is This is not a restriction because it is just a framework. You can use JAX also. Um, but PyTorch is probably very simple to start off with. So you can implement most of these modules with PyTorch ecosystem that is Torch and Torch Vision. And some parts of NumPy, SciPy, Scikit-learn if you need some additional components for data wrangling and things like that. So this, hopefully, this mini project will help you understand all steps of the process. So I, have, I think I had a question from somebody. With small data set, how can we check that performance is fine or not? So this comes back to standard machine learning practices. One is cross-validation. You split a small chunk of, if you have a small data set only, you split a very small chunk and benchmark progress on that. Sometimes you can get a not very reliable performance estimate from this. So you would do something called k-fold cross-validation. So you split a chunk train on one chunk, test on the smaller piece, and record the performance. Do this process again. Split another small chunk as a test site, train on the, train on the rest of them, train, test on this, and so on. So you basically do k for cross validation. So with a small data set, you can do that. For MNIST, it's convenient because the creators themselves gave a test set. So we know we don't have to really worry about creating our own test set to measure, the, measure our performance. So yeah, those are pretty much everything that I wanted to cover in this session. So uh, as I said, 
deep learning does pretty cool stuff and i hope i, I have convinced you to uh, jump onto this bandwagon is accuracy totally depends on the data set yes it is like for some as i said for mnist it is easy to achieve 98 99 with very small networks for for image net you probably need 100 layers of processing before you get to that performance so yes accuracy depends on the data set uh, accuracy as in how how uh, on the data set and the network that you choose so Does accuracy vary for the same code? Yes, it does. As I said, it it does it varies a little, um, and this is this is a side artifact of the randomness. So so when you start the network, uh, the weights have some values. When you just instantiate the network, the weights have some values, right? Those are randomly generated. Each time you run the code, it 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 it, it has some random weights. So that initialization has some impact. Also, I said we shuffle the data set, right? Which means each time you do the network sees the data, it is not in the same order. So because of which there is a, again a small variation in the accuracy between two runs. If you just rerun the entire code again, you get instead of 98.9, you will probably get 90, sorry, 98.9, you will get 98.8. And this is very very common. Yeah, I think no more question. Maybe now session chairs can uh, <clears throat> take over. And uh, thanks a lot this, uh, for the very interesting talk. <laughs> thanks <laughs> Even for I, having me here. Even I am also running your experiment. Cool. <laughs> yeah. So over to session chair. So, so is uh, Dr. Rakesh Padavantrai or Sudan Subala is available? I'm not, uh, I'm not sure. So, yeah. Yeah, actually, I'm on mute. Uh, mute. Thank you, Ravi, for the nice talk and all the queries actually you have handled. Uh, thanks a lot. So, I think we'll close over here and the next session will start at 3 p.m. Yeah. Thank you very much. So, so thank you, Teja. Thank you, Dr. Rakesh Volvarantai and uh, Sudan Subala for the uh, sharing the sessions and all the participants. So uh, those have interested for this mini project already, I have shared my email ID so you can contact and already there is a, um, there is a channel is already, Discord channel is already established. I, and uh, Teza is also there. So you can discuss with him directly about the project. And uh, uh, yeah, so you can get all the expert helps and uh, Hopefully, you can uh, successfully at least you can practice and you can learn the things when we start really implementing. And already, as uh, he suggested, also you can try for ODA font, and that one will be really helpful. So, thank you all. So, maybe we can.